And our last session of the year. <laughs> okay. So there's some interesting cases here for you guys this morning. Hi, good morning, Dr. Cockrell. This is Amy. I'll be doing the first one. Okay. Um, so it looks like we have this punch um, from this low power. Um, the epidermis looks, you know, largely normal, um, you know, similar with the dermis. What catches my eye is kind of like the periadnexal and perivascular areas, like this dark blacker um, areas. Good. So do you think this is more of an inflammatory process or a neoplastic process? I would say. It doesn't really look like there's like a, a true neoplastic process or like a lot of inflammation either. If I had to choose between one, probably more towards inflammatory. Good. Excellent. Yeah, it's a little bit of inflamed here, not a lot, but I agree um, that would not. Is there any neoplastic process that you might think about when you see something like this? Well, you know, I was thinking that the darker areas was possibly pigment. Yes, it is pigment. So that's going to be the question here. So what kind of pigment are we dealing with here? Yeah, you know, this looks kind of darker than what I think for the normal pigment. Like in the basal layer, you can see kind of the, the more normal, normal pigment this pig patient has. So oh, the pigment is this up here that you're... Looking yeah. At? What is that pigment? Like that's like the mel normal melanin the patient has. Yes, that's melanin, right. Now, can you get a significant amount of melanin in the dermis that can look pretty dark and almost black? Yes. Um, you know, some ways you could get it, you know, could be like a tattoo, but it's not like widely distributed like enough for me to think of tattoo. Um, we also think what, about wait, what about melanin? Let's, so I was talking about what about melanin being in the dermis? Can you get melanin in the dermis that can look pretty dark and really look black in, in some cases? Not um, something other than melanin, like a tattoo, okay. or melanin itself. Yes, you can. Um, you can get like melanophages. Um, good, like in post-inflammatory pigmentary alteration. That's that's a good idea. Excellent. And where, where else do you see a lot of melanin in the dermis. Sometimes it really looks very dark. Um, You're probably overthinking it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you had like, um, like a lanic civic nevus. Like yeah, 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 exactly. So some, some nevi can be very dark and, and look really, really heavily melanized and, and can almost really look black histologically because melanin itself is black. You know, the actual squid ink that you get like squid ink pasta at the uh, restaurants and whatnot, or you see this squid shoots out, the octopus shoots out the ink in the ocean. It's really black. Um, it creates a black cloud that they can kind of run, you know, swim away from. So it's 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 an actually the pigment itself is black. It becomes brown when it sort of disperses, and you get, mm -hmm. uh, you know, smaller amounts of it. It's really super concentrated. It really can look pretty much just jet black. So blue nevus is what I was getting at. Um, sometimes you get regressed melanomas, and we're seeing patients now that are taking some of these biologics, the checkpoint inhibitors, when they get a regressed metastasis of melanoma, it can give you like a puddle of, of black melanin in the dermis. So uh, obviously, you know, when you're looking at a pigment, you want to ask yourself, okay, well, what's the nature of the pigment? So there's some inflammation here. Um, so you got to say, well, well, what is this material here? So it might, you might say, well, could it be melanin? Well, maybe, but then do you think this is melanin here? When you're looking at it, I think it's just very dark. So we're, yes. we're not typically the yeah. melanin. Good, and it's almost got these clumps, like here, like it's a like you know you can just almost imagine this was sort of maybe like a little tiny um, clump of this material that got put in here, and this there is an inflammatory response to it. I mean, it's trying to body's trying to get rid of it at least in some areas. 
Um, and then you can see, if you look at it, there's little tiny dots, you got these larger aggregations and clumps. So yeah, this, this doesn't look like typical melanin. And uh, it doesn't really transmit light at all. Usually, if you look at melanin, even when it's really, really dark, and blue nevus, for example, that's heavily melanized, you'll still see the melanin granules in there. So you can actually see them. They're, they're brownish um, when you look at them in the microscope. So it's it does it's not like this where it's just solid jet black like this. So that tells you it's probably not melanin. So mm -hmm. what is so that's the, the key teaching point in this in this case is, is what is the nature of this pigment? What do you think it is? Um, so going back, we, you know, we you know, it was not widespread enough for us to think that too. We were um what do you say me about that that business of not being widespread like a tattoo? What what do you mean by that? I'm I'm confused to touch. Um, like it's just contrary, like the perivascular and periadenexal areas, where if it um were a tattoo, we'd kind of see it more like distributed in more areas of the dermis. Well, there's two kinds of tattoos that people get. There's the professional tattoo that everybody seems to want to have on their body these days. And if you look at those, you're right. You'll see kind of more of a diffuse uh, pigmentation. It's usually kind of situated kind of in this area right up in here. It doesn't really go super deep. Um, and it's often associated with multiple colors. You'll see green, yellow, red, uh, dark, you know, color like this in a way. So you'll, you'll see those kind of things. And then there's the other kind of tattoo that's not professional. Uh, maybe the one that's done in a, in a prison, you know, or maybe somebody stabs himself with something and gets a traumatic tattoo. So those mm. are a couple of things. And then there's one other kind of tattoo that uh, it's become less common today, but it was more common back when I was a kid and I used to go to the dentist to get my teeth drilled out. Um, what tattoo is that that occurs in the, in the mouth area quite commonly? It's now actually, it's more common um, say in the earlobe or in the nose than it used to be um, in the in the gingival area. Uh, like an amalgam tattoo? Yes, silver amalgam or mercury amalgam is, is what that is. And so they, when the dentists make that amalgam and uh, yeah, you guys probably have never had that experience, but they, after they drill out your tooth and you got a cavity, they take a little syringe-like device and they sort of just inject this stuff and sort of pack it in. And it's kind of like putty. It's got an interesting sensation that you kind of feel when they kind of put that in there. And sometimes they miss and they put a little bit of it in your um, gingiva or maybe your buccal mucosa and it gives you a, a blackish colored area and it looks like a melanoma. <laughs> so we get skin biopsies sometimes or biopsies of those areas rule out malignant melanoma, usually in older people that because they don't use uh, mercury amalgam, silver amalgam anymore. They use porcelain and things like that. So they have a different kind of material for filling today. But uh, that's another one. Now, where is the, if this were, say, mercury or, or like localized argyria is the other name for that. And, and the reason, why would I say that the more common locations today are like in, say, the ear or the nose area or, you know, maybe other parts of the body? Why is it more common there? than in the gingival area or the buccal mucosa today in the 2000s, 21st century? Nobody uh, knows. <laughs> because of all the piercings people get. Oh, okay. It's metallic piercings. And a lot of times, maybe they want them to be taken out or you'll they'll, they'll get a little discoloration there. And then you say, wow, I'm concerned this is something serious. And it's basically just a little localized argyria that occurs because of some silver or some other metallic uh, impurities that actually then cause a tattoo. And whenever they, when you get a, a localized cutaneous argyria or even systemic argyria, people that take the silver eye drops or the nose drops or whatever, those actually are giving, they're staining the elastic fibers. So you'll actually see the, if you look carefully in that, you'll actually see little small granules that are often around um, adnexal structures, and they're little fine granules, tiny little small fine sort of golden brown like granules or blackish brown type granules, and they're actually staining the elastic fibers. So this you can see is not really staining anything. It's just these clumps here 
that are sitting in the dermis and it doesn't transmit any light. It's not, um, you know, brownish or, or tiny black dots. It's, it's really just jet black here. So this is an example of a carbon tattoo. And it's probably you know, the, the most common situation is uh, some kids, you know, gets it, they stab themselves with a pencil or maybe some other kid in the class stabs a, their friend with a pencil and they get a, you know, carbon in here. And a lot of times these maybe were done when the, the person was maybe in grade school and then maybe 20, 30 years later, they say, yeah, this thing looks ugly, take it out. And then they get a biopsy and it looks like this. So this is a, a carbon tattoo. Mm -hmm. Now there's only... One other um, type of pigment is so I just I, I would rec I would recommend you guys kind of at least learn what the various pigments are in tattoo pigments because they, the board does ask those on a quick you know, occasion like um, cinnabar, you know, red, mercury, cadmium, yellow, you know those kind of things. So you may get cobalt green and blue. So you may get some questions about that. But there's one other that we sometimes see, uh, and that's elemental mercury. So but also back in the old days, uh, they used to make thermometers that actually had mercury inside there. And, and occasionally somebody will uh, get an injury where the mercury gets injected into the skin. It's usually, a, again, a traumatic injury. Maybe they're, you know, fall on a thermometer nurse or something like that that had mercury in it. And if you see that, you'll actually see these little round, they almost look like little droplets of just jet black doesn't transmit any light at all, just sitting in the dermis. You don't get these little small, fine granules like this. You just see these little, look like little raindrops, black raindrops in the skin. And you may see like, you know, four or five ranging in different sizes. I, I don't think the board's going to ask that because it's almost just of historical interest, but um, it's kind of an interesting other kind of pigment that you can see uh, that's traumatically induced. And then sometimes you'll see soil. Um, that's kind of carbon also. So somebody's in an automobile accident or something like that, and they'll get some soil in there and it's probably got some carbonaceous material and it can kind of look like this, but it's coupled with some polarizable foreign material, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hopefully that'll help you guys out. You won't have to, you'll get it right if they ask it for you on the exam. Okay, this is a good one. Good morning. I'll take this one. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a little shave. Um, low power looks like there's some maybe pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. We see these really um, well defined, localized little maybe papules of inflammation in the dermis. Yeah, what do we call that pattern when we see this? I focused on the nodular dermatitis. Good. Potential. Excellent. Very, very good. That's exactly what you should pick up here. This is nodular dermatitis. So these are little nodules of inflammation, just like you said. So that's that's great. Um, we probably wouldn't say papule, I guess, because that's sort <laughs> of a skin lesion, fundamental lesion. But but we refer to it histologically as nodular uh, and then when it's really involving kind of everything side to side, top to bottom, nodular, diffuse. So it's it's fairly diffuse here as well. So that's good. So the, and the nice thing about that is, again, there's really not a gazillion diagnoses that fall into that pattern. So you can kind of um, start making a, your di differential diagnosis a little bit more specific. So when you went to higher magnification, what kind of inflammatory infiltrate did you see in these little nodules here? It's it's really mixed. Um, it looks like granulomatous information inflammation. I saw lots of histiocytes. Um, there's neutrophils. There's plasma cells, and then I also saw a lot of eosinophils. Good. Um, the histiocytes. It's kind of a little bit deceiving. I think if if you really look carefully, um, some of these may be histiocytes, but I think actually what a lot of them are, are blood vessels that have got epithelioid. Um, endothelial cells that are just kind of prominent. Mm. So they're kind of looking like histiocytes, histiocytes, but that's okay. I mean, you're, you're totally correct that it's a mixed infiltrate with neutrophils, eosinophils in this nodular pattern. And uh, what about the neutrophils? Were all of them sort of intact or were any of them sort of demonstrating any other sort of findings? No, I did see some like um, dust, nuclear dust. Excellent. Good. So what was your differential diagnosis of this pattern? Well, I noticed these really atypical looking lymphocytes in some places. 
They just stained really purple and large. Um, and they looked a little atypical to me. So I was thinking something lymphomatous. I thought maybe granulomatous mycosis fungoides or a CD30 lymphoproliferative disorder, since we see those eosinophils. What about the neutrophils in that though? Is that, you commonly see neutrophils in nuclear dust and granulomatous Not in that? really. You can think about granuloma faciale. Yeah, there you go. So now you're thinking of, yes, mm -hmm. granuloma faciale. Now let's look, go back to lower magnification. What part of the body are we on? Are we on the face here? I don't think so. Yeah, it seems like probably not. There's there's maybe a couple of uh, sebaceous glands, but not very many. So if it's not on the face, maybe it's say a, you know near an extremity or something like that, and it has histologic features that look like granuloma faciale. What uh, is the diagnosis? Erythema elevatum. Good erythema elevatum diutinum. Excellent. That's exactly what this is. So this, and this is a, the good pattern for it. Now, you know, granulomas and F, that's a, generally doesn't give you this kind of nodular proliferation like you see here. I think that mm -hmm. nodular infiltrate that you saw was, was is really helpful. Um, the cases, of, most of the cases of granulomas that I've seen also have features usually of, of patch or plaque stage MF kind of overlying with epidermotropism and you just get histiocytes that kind of come in to sort of fight off the mycosis fungoides. So that's at least what some people think is going on there. Uh, but doesn't usually give you the nodular infiltrate and doesn't give you the nuclear dust and neutrophils that you see. So um, tell us a little bit about EED. What, what's going on there in that entity? What, what's the pathophysiology of it, if you will? I think it's a, it's a small vessel vasculitis. Yeah, it's thought to be a chronic vasculitis um, that gives you this nodular pattern. And as time goes on, the vasculitic changes, and, and, you, and you can see maybe there's a little bit of fibrin in that blood vessel right there. It doesn't, I've seen a couple of cases over the years. Uh, I saw one case many years ago that we had a really early biopsy of it, and it looked like just classic LCD. And as time went on, it, it developed this pattern. And then eventually they turned into the nodules that you see with those fibrous sort of onion skin like fibrosis surrounding me. So as, as this thing progresses over the course of time, the inflammation starts getting less and less. It usually doesn't go to zero, but it starts getting less prominent and you start getting more fibrosis. It's kind of an onion skin fibrosis that surrounds these little nodules and you end up looking more like a, a fibrotic process, which is kind of interesting. So I'm not sure a lot of us know why it does that, but um, if you get a patient that has EED, do you just kind of high five yourself and then move on to the next case or, or what do you do in that situation? Uh, I would probably start them on treatment. You can do antibiotics like Dapsone, I think. Dapsone might work. I, I think that's kind of what a lot of people use. It's sadly enough, doesn't really work too terribly well. Some people have tried laser. Um, you know, I, I maybe with all these eosinophils, you might even try, you know, one of the new um, jack inhibitors or maybe do Pixin or something like that possibly. I, I don't think there's really super good treatment for this, but there's, but the other, the real question I was asking is, do you just kind of not worry about anything else that could possibly be going on with the patient? Oh, um, they could have some kind of arthralgias. You should make sure that they're, that they don't have joint disease as well. Well, you know, it's, it's been associated with systemic illnesses. You know, it's been associated with certain uh, paraproteinemias. Uh, you want to make sure they don't have HIV okay. infection, mm -hmm. for example. You want to make sure that they don't have uh, some, that there's some bacterial infections that have sort of precipitated these. So uh, make sure the patient doesn't have any underlying disease. That's probably the most important thing. Uh, so just rule that out. Once you've done that, then you can unfortunately try some of these therapies that don't work. And this, this is really kind of a bonus question, but uh, these little clefts here, those actually often have cholesterol in them. That's not just necessarily an artifact. And one of the old names for this disease used to be extracellular cholesterolosis because a lot of these lesions get kind of a yellowish uh, color. And that's probably because of the neutrophils and inflammatory infiltrate kind of breaking down, releasing some of their uh, you know, products, and then they get these little cholesterol clefts. So you see that in EED, but probably the most important thing is just to make sure that they don't have any underlying systemic illness that's associated with it. So, so very, so good. You got the, the answers correct. I mean, and it's kind of a histologic identical twin to granuloma faciale, only it's not occurring on the face. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and um, just make sure that they don't have any underlying disease when you, you make the diagnosis. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, this is uh, a good one here. I can take this one. Okay, great. Um, so I think just at low power, it's a pretty deep punch. So they must have been looking for some sort of deep process. <laughs> um, there's some thickened collagen bundles, maybe some clefting. Okay. I think I'm not seeing a lot of inflammation. No, not and I'm many. not, and I'm not seeing like increased number of fibroblasts. Good. So it's not a fibrotic process. What about down here? Hmm. Looks like very thick collagen bundles to me. Yeah, very thick. And what? Are, and you said the fibroblasts are not much increased. In fact, what do you think? Do you think maybe they're actually decreased? If you kind of look in this field right here, for example? I think they're decreased. Yeah, they're almost absent in some areas. And, and notice that they're homogenized. In other words, you don't see these nice, uh, up at the top, up here, um, you can still make out some pretty good you know, collagen bundles themselves. I mean, this this may be some atrophy going on up here, but you say, yeah, there's a collagen bundle, there's a collagen bundle. These are sort of discrete collagen bundles. But then you get down in this, this area and they're no longer really discrete. They're really um, homogenized. You can't really tell where one collagen bundle begins and another one ends. It's just kind of all smudged together. And there's a decrease in the number of fibroblasts. So what do we call that reaction pattern? Sclerosis. Good, sclerosis. So once you get it into the sclerosing and fibrosing pattern, again, that's one of the nine main patterns of inflammatory skin diseases, uh, then you have your, your differential diagnosis. And so sort of the good news, bad news about that, I mean, the, the good news is that in a way, you can't really tell one from another unless there's some other you know, findings there. Uh, that's also the bad news for the patient because if you know, it's sometimes difficult to tell uh, which type of sclerosing disorder they have. You know, do they have morphia? Are they going to develop, um, you know, progressive systemic sclerosis with lung disease and, you know, things like that. So, you know, you can't be sure just looking at a biopsy. You know, a lot of times rheumatologists wish we could tell them just looking at this what they have, but it really requires clinical correlation. So what are some diseases other than morphia and scleroderma that can give you a sclerotic pattern like this and this is kind of interesting because most of the sclerosis here is kind of in the bottom as opposed to the top, which is, is a little bit unusual. I'm not sure that really tells us the diagnosis here. Um, I'm not sure I want you to think that it would. I, I think it, what may have happened is that they had some sclerosis up here. When sclerotic collagen regenerates in a way, like you know, patients that get morphia and eventually develop atrophoderma piscini perini, um, this is kind of what that looks like. It looks like the collagen sort of separates and it's it looks kind of atrophic. And if you do an elastic tissue stain, there's decreased elastic fibers. And so this is probably a late stage sclerosis where now it's become atrophic and you still have some active sclerosis at the bottom. So I don't, I'm not sure that really is a clue to the, any diagnosis. But what I would like you to know is the board examination could put uh, a multiple choice question and they show this and say, which of the following disorders uh, is not associated with this histologic reaction pattern. And so what are some entities that are associated with it, other than scleroderma and morphia, for example? Um, I think you'd see sclerosis with scleroedema. You know, interestingly enough, no. Um, it's kind of a misnomer. It, the, the skin is thickened, and sclera means hard just like your sclera of your eye, you know, that's just, a, it just means hard. It doesn't mean anything about the college or anything. It just means it's hard. So they got the name because it looked edematous to the guys who described it back in the, you know, 1800s, whenever they described it. And it feels hard. But if you look at it under the microscope, there really isn't sclerotic collagen. The collagen bundles are increased in number and they're thickened. And you actually get, if you look carefully, you can see mucin between the collagen bundles. So it's not really sclerotic. It's, 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 it feels hard, but histologically, you don't see this. So just remember that. It, it, it's, it's got the same beginning name, but 
it doesn't have the same histologic appearance at all. So that's actually surprisingly not one of the diseases that gives you sclerosis. But what are some others that, that do? So again, this is a reaction pattern. So it's a, there's a family of things that give you this. So what else? Where else can you see sclerotic collagen? Uh, radiation dermatitis? Yes, radiation dermatitis, chronic radiation dermatitis. Good. There's a few others. Lichen sclerosis. Yeah, uh, lichen sclerosis. And that's if it's pure, true lichen sclerosis, you'll just get papillary dermal you know, involvement. You don't really get the reticular dermal involvement in that. If it's true, pure LSNA, we see a lot of cases of morphia with features of LSNA where you get both. And clinically, it could look more like LSNA because the white ivory you know, changes are what you see clinically. Uh, lipodermatosclerosis. Good. Yes, you do see it in that. Usually not to this degree, but yes, you do. And you also get the associated uh, membranous fat necrosis changes and the stasis alteration changes above it. You would never know what this disease is here, but if it were on a multiple choice test, you'd, you'd probably pick it out. What Maybe is graft versus host disease also yes, has good, sclerosis? Good, good. Yes, yeah, scleroderamoid GVHD. That's actually what this turned out to be, believe it or not. This was a patient that had a known bone marrow transplant, and uh, they took a biopsy of it, and that this is what it looked like. It's kind of interesting that it didn't have the sclerosis in the top of the dermis, maybe just because it had been present for a long time, and that became atrophic. But yeah, that's another one. There's a couple of others, just, just to kind of make the list complete. Um so when you see this, I want you to just kind of instantly have a little reflex that goes down about six or seven diseases that you're down about probably about five or six right now um, that you think about when you see this. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Okay. What if the patient had a hirsutism, um, had a high iron ferritin level, um, maybe had a bunch of scars on the back of their hands and they come in with some thickened doughy skin and then you biopsy or maybe they got the shield like firm area on the chest and wow, what's that, you know, and then you biopsy and it looks like this. What's that entity known as? I don't know. Sclerodermoid porphyricotania tarda. So you can see a scleroderma like morphology in PCT also. So that can give you this pattern as well. And then the last one that we see sclerotic collagen in, uh, well, there's a couple others, but the, the other one that's big is necrobiosis lipoidica. We talked about that, I think, a couple of weeks ago. So you get sclerotic collagen in that condition also. And then if you biopsy uh, weathering nodules on the ear, um, which is basically sort of analogous to CNH, you'll get sclerotic collagen in that situation. Uh, sometimes in lupus, uh, chronic uh, LE, you can get sclerotic collagen that kind of looks like uh, you know, morphia, and then, of course, all the diseases in the family of, of morphia, scleroderma, uh, mixed connective tissue disease, overlap syndromes, uh, sclerodermatomyositis, all of those can give you sclerotic collagen. So just important to know the diseases where you can get this pattern. Um, and, you know, they, they, so you'll hopefully you learned a couple of things. So maybe you didn't know about sclerodermoid PCT, or you didn't know about, um, they, you didn't know about sclerodermoid uh, GVHD, so that's good, but just make sure that you know some of those other conditions where you can see sclerotic collagen. And one other thing that you usually see, not here, but you often see plasma cells. I think we mentioned that before whenever you get sclerotic collagen. Okay. Hey, good morning, Dr. Cockrell. I can take this one. Okay, great. So it looks like there's a punch um, of the scalp, lots of terminal hair follicles down into the fat. And um, on the top of the epidermis, there looks like there's a, a lot of acantholysis with like a um, super basilar split right above the dermal papilla. Good. And of course, some hemorrhage around there. And then underneath that, there's a pretty dense um, lymphocytic infiltrate, I thought. Yeah, is it only lymphocytes? <clears throat> I thought there was maybe like, could have been like some eosinophils potentially. Yeah. There are some eosinophils. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. And then, uh, so here's suprabasilar clefting that you mentioned. What about here? Yeah, so that's still kind of intraepidermal. 
Um, there's like some ballooning or potential acanthalysis. Like some of those look like necrotic keratinocytes. There are good. There's some necrotic keratinocytes and there's also, I'm not sure they're really ballooning. I, I agree with you. I think they're just kind of acanthalytic up here, but is this super basal or here? No, no. So how do you reconcile this with this? Yeah, I think they're just kind of like two separate patterns. And now, you know, and given that this was a scalp as well, you know, I was looking, I think on the right, something that just kind of caught my eye, um, that, that rightmost hair follicle. Wasn't too sure if that was just kind of a, a catagen hair follicle or if there was like acantholysis within that follicular epithelium as well. Well, you tell me. What about here? Is that acantholysis? Yeah, so I, I would, you know, I was leaning more towards like acantholysis. In that good, case. good. I hope you not only lean towards that, that you actually just fell into it. And so, <laughs> so it was definitely that. And there's some necrotic cells. Remember, you get acantholytic cells, they can die, you know, because they're lost or connection to the epidermis. They don't have any more nutrients there. So they can, they can die. Um, and then uh, these follicles, what stage of, uh, of the hair cycle are we looking at here? I believe that one should be, is it catagen? Good. It's got a thick, massive, glassy basal membrane zone, so it's shifting into catagen. Here's one that's gone from catagen, still here, early telogen over here, and this is antigen. So you got three different cycles. Beautiful example of that right here. And uh, why do you think that's happening? I don't know if any of this is, would be driven by like the inflammatory infiltrate. Or... Yeah, yeah. No, I think you. I think that's exactly what's happening. This is a huge, this is really an acute inflammatory process. Um, it's a stress on this area. Um, it's caused the hairs to kind of shift into these, into the state. So this would have an area of alopecia in addition to this crusted, eroded area up here. So what's your diagnosis here? So it might be kind of a, a broad differential, but with like the super basilar split and like in, involving also the follicular epithelium, maybe potentially pemphigus vulgaris. Good. Okay, good. That's, that is the diagnosis. Okay. So it's a, actually a, a small differential <laughs> diagnostic. However, this is important because I don't want you to make a mistake on an exam if you see this. And they have the, what are they going to put down as a choice? Let's say it's a multiple choice question. And they have, what's the most likely diagnosis? A, pemphigus foliaceus. B, pemphigus erythematosus. C, pemphigus vulgaris. D, Haley Haley disease. E, perineoplastic pemphigus. What's your, why, what's your, what are you going to choose here? Uh, you can probably go like Haley Haley potentially or. Well, that's what I don't want you to choose. Yeah. I no, don't. Exactly. If you were given that, that's what um, would be the trick answer. Yeah, we'll see. That, and that's the whole thing here. And number one, it's on the scalp. When's the last time you saw Haley Haley on the scalp? Yeah. Never, number one. And then this is the most prominent finding. You know, the fact that you've got this super basilar. You never see this in Haley Haley. But in Pemphigus, you can sometimes see this. In Pemphigus vulgaris, you can sometimes see this. So that's what. The like Dr. Freeman used to say years ago, my old partner, is that there are a lot of things in textbooks and much of it is true. And so, you know, this, that if you read a textbook, will you ever find in the, in the chapter on Pemphigus vulgaris that you can sometimes see Haley Haley like histology like this, like the dilapidated brick wall going not only super basilar, but above the epidermis in the middle of the epidermis? No, you won't. But in the real world, you do see it. And that's why you shouldn't fall into the pit of saying, uh-oh, it's Haley Haley, when you've got everything else showing classic pemphigus vulgaris here. So uh, just remember that sometimes in pemphigus vulgaris, you can see this kind of change. Now, now not in superficial pemphigus. That, that doesn't happen there. But in, in pemphigus vulgaris, you can sometimes get some changes that simulate Haley Haley disease, like here. So it doesn't mean they have two different conditions. And if you did immunofluorescence here, it's going to light up, uh, you know, like the classic pattern. And it's it's not going to, you know, it wouldn't be negative like you would see in Haley Haley disease. It just shows you that you can get some, quote, epitope spreading type of histology uh, when you see pemphigus vulgaris. It can sometimes look a little bit like Haley Haley in some areas. 
So that hopefully that's helpful to you. Now let's talk about the eosinophils. Do you commonly see eos in Pemphigus vulgaris? You do. Yeah, you you kind of you do. In fact, actually, interestingly enough, occasionally, and you'll probably see this every now and then, a patient will come in with a very high eosinophil count in Pemphigus vulgaris, circulating eosinophils. It can be, you know, very high. Um, I've seen that a few times over the years. I don't know why, but it does happen every now and then. And, you know, kind of makes you wonder if they might respond to, you know, one of our new anti-eosinophilic drugs, like maybe Dupixin or maybe one of the new JAK inhibitors or something that might help with some of the inflammation. So uh, we know that, uh, uh, you know, our, our treatment of choice today is probably rituximab, but, you know, you kind of wonder if maybe if you wiped out some of this inflammation also, you might uh, get some with the eosinophils in there, you might get some benefit of therapy. So that's good. And that's that's a pretty good example. That's something that you could very well get on the exam. Now, I don't know if they're going to show you something that's got this artifact, the secondary change in it, but at least you'll realize now that that can happen. And if they do happen to show you a slide that's got that in there, don't let it trick you. Don't, don't be tripped up by it. We'll let the other guys from other departments, other, other medical schools get tripped up on it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Taylor. I'll take this one. Okay, great. We have a shave. Um, from okay. this power view, I was thinking we either have potentially a nodular dermatitis or even a neoplasm um, from good. this. Good. Excellent. Very, very good. And if it were a neoplasm, do you think it would be more likely to be benign or malignant based on what we have here? So I think it's pretty well circumscribed, um, kind of in the center. I would lean more towards benign. Good. Excellent. And it's also, if you draw a line down the middle of it, and we don't have the whole thing, but it probably would sort of be like this. You can fold one side on the other, and it looks pretty much uh, like one side looks pretty much like the other. So that's going to strongly favor benign here. Uh, any idea what kind of cells we might be dealing with? Um, yeah, so from here, they're kind of more like a blue purpley color. So <laughs> potentially like a basaloid type of cell or histiocytic type of cell. Yeah, we have maybe lymphocytes possibly let them look kind of dark. And then you do have some paler cells admixed in there. So I, I totally agree. Maybe some of these are going to be histiocytes or something else. So let's go to higher magnification and we'll see if we can make out a little bit more about these cells. And they do have some interesting features now, don't they? They do. I was thinking these looked like foamy histiocytes. Good. Excellent. Foamy histiocytes. So what's your differential diagnosis when you see foamy histiocytes like this? Yeah. So my differential included xanthoma, um, juvenile xanthogranuloma, um, potentially like a xanthomatous a fibroma. Um, good. <laughs> Those are good differentials. That, that's, that's, that's good. Those are kind of the things you should think about there. So that's excellent. Um, juvenile xanthogranuloma, what's missing here about that? Yeah. So you would see eosinophils and the Teuton giant cells. Do you always see EOs? I don't know if you always do. I think it's just okay, you, whenever the word always is there, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you yes, you do see EOs in, in JXG. And if you kind of look carefully, there actually are some in here. And then what is this cell right here? <laughs> I think that's a Teuton giant cell. It is. It is a Teuton giant cell. So we don't have very many. So what does that tell you about the potential juvenile xanthogranuloma here. If you don't have too many Teuton giant cells and you have more of these sort of foamy histiocytes and a lymphocytic infiltrate, and maybe in many cases, a, a lot of eosinophils in, in sort of this variant of JXG. I would think that it would be less likely on the differential. Um, I, I kind of think the JXG has classically a lot of the giant cells. Well, the teaching this is actually a, a JXG, and it actually did occur in a child. But when you get an early lesion that's in an early stage of evolution, so let's say one's only been there, say, for you know a few weeks or a month, and you biopsy it, um, it's going to look more like this than if one's, say, been there maybe six months or a year. 
the longer they've been around, the more Teuton giant cells that they have. So if you get kind of an early lesion and some, uh, there are some syndromes where you can get multiple xanthogranulomas. I believe like you can get leukemia. I think even in, in some variants of neurofibromatosis, there's been some associations with XGs and underlying myeloproliferative disorders. Um, in those situations, if they kind of occur eruptively, they may have this pattern more than you get the Teuton giant cells. So if you get an early evolving inflammatory stage of XG, you don't get as many Teuton giant cells yet because they haven't had a chance to develop. So that's the main teaching point is just this wouldn't exclude the diagnosis of it just because you don't have a lot of them yet. So it's more like the chronology, the lives of lesions, if you will. So if you catch it early, not as many Teuton giant cells, catch it later, less of the foamy histocytes and more of the Teuton giant cells. And these probably turn into Teuton giant cells. And in, in, I, I, I think they eventually do, because if you look at a Teuton giant cell, they have some of that foamy material still in the cytoplasm, as well as the multiple nuclei and the and the sort of amphiphilic cytoplasm. So I'm not sure about that, but my sort of thinking is that it, you have a lot of these cells early, and as they as the lesion st sticks around for a while, then they eventually turn into Teuton giant cells. Now, what other entities are sort of in the differential diagnosis of XG and xanthomas when you see this pattern? So. There's maybe one or two other things to think about. You had a good differential, but there's a couple of other things just to, you know, potentially add in there that they might stick on the on an exam to kind of try to trip you up. Um, maybe like progressive nodular histiocytosis. Yeah, they could do that. Yeah, some of those weird non-X histiocytoses. Yeah, that could be on there. One of those. Um. What about multicentric reticulohistiocytosis? Would that look like this? I think that that would be less foamy. Good. Yes, it is less foamy. You don't really see the foamy histiocytes in there. But um, that's something to kind of think about. And a lot of times we'll see a lesion that's got tons of those cells that look like the cells of reticulohistiocytic granuloma, maybe with a few of these cells back in the background. And then we say, well this would favor it maybe being an XG with more, um, you know, reticulohistiocytic cells than foamy, than, than uh, Teuton giant cells. So there can be some overlap between those in some cases. And the clinical between those two is obviously quite different. I think a lot of people sort of think today, if they have something that's just one or two lesions and they have some of those uh, cells that look like reticulohistiocytic uh, giant cells, and maybe if a few of these, maybe a few Teuton giant cells, it's probably just a variant of an XG that's just got more reticulohistiocytic cells in it versus the, the disease that's got the widespread number of lesions with the mutilating arthritis. So I think a lot of us sort of lump uh, today that if they just have a couple of things, rather than calling it reticulohistiocytosis, we just say it's probably an XG with more reticulohistiocytic morphology than that disease. So that's the one you really have to worry about because they get that horrible arthritis and you want to try to treat it um, if you can before they get to that stage. Uh, and the treatment used to be bad, but I think now with some of the new biologics, maybe we can actually sort of be more effective. All right, good. So hopefully that was, uh, was helpful for you guys. All right, I'll take this one. This is Caroline. Um, so this was a punch biopsy. Um, I can see already like several hair follicles um, on higher power. I noticed kind of like the dark. I'm going to let you go to higher power yet. Oh, <laughs> okay. So let's, so let's talk about this here. You said you saw hair follicles. Mm -hmm. What part of the body do you think you're on? I was thinking probably scalp or... Thinking absolutely correct. Absolutely perfectly scalp. Now, why scalp as opposed to face? Um, I think there aren't as many like sebaceous follicles that would make Good. me think of face. Um, what, and about then... the, what about the depth of the hair follicles themselves? Yes, they're pretty deep. They are deep. They're rooted very far down in the subcutaneous fat. Okay. Is this normal? Is this a normal biopsy? 
No, I thought it looked like pretty square. And then also just the hair follicles themselves look a little deformed. What do you have when you're looking at it at a biopsy from the scalp? What are some of the things you're looking at to decide whether it's normal or abnormal? Hmm, I... If I biopsied your scalp and we stuck it up here, mm-hmm. what's it going to look like? It's going to be normal, number one. Mm-hmm. What's going to look? What's the? What's it going to look like from a normal perspective? What are we going to see in a normal biopsy of the scalp? Um, like hair follicles and in different stages, mostly like. Well, we probably in your. If we biopsy your scalp, there's probably going to be one stage. Or oh, mostly. Um, like telogen. I or, hope not. Sorry, I really sorry, catagen. I hope we don't see catagen follicles in your scalp okay. either. That would be sad if we did. Okay, so mostly antigen. Mostly antigen. Yes, yes, yes. And how many antigen on yeah. this power in a normal scalp are we going to see normally? I think like eighty percent. Yeah, eight to ten. Well, well, eight probably a hundred percent are going to be an antigen, but there's going to be eight to ten rooted down here in the subcutaneous fat on a four millimeter punch biopsy from the scalp. How many do we have here? I didn't see any really. Well, this one is oh, okay. That's a, little, that's a live follicle. This one's doing okay, and this one's still probably okay here. I'm not sure about these two. Those don't look too healthy, and then there's only three, so we're missing seven. We're missing mm-hmm. between five and seven antigen follicles here. So if we're looking at this person's scalp, what does it look like? Does it look like your scalp? No, it's no. abnormal. It's going to look like there's not enough hair there. It's going to be an alopecia. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, is it going to look like a white, no hairs coming out of it at all? Like, like Yule Brenner or... You know, the rock, um, is it going to look like their scalp? No, because we do see some. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we've got a few that are still in antigen. So there's going to be a few little sprigs of hair there. And then there's going to be some areas where there's less hair. So it's not going to be total 100% alopecia there. What else are we not going to see when we look at that scalp clinically based on this? If we took a dermoscopy, our little, you know, dermoscopic image, little thing, and we did looked at high magnification, what are the ostea of the follicles going to look like? Are they going to be totally wiped out? Are we going to see like total like scarring that's like destroyed those little ostea? Or are we going to see still patent ostea with maybe a little pair of shafts coming out of there in some areas? I would imagine they'd look kind of scarred based on this. Well, if you see a scarring alopecia histologically, what it, what are the two patterns of scar that we see under the microscope of scarring alopecia? Mm, I need to review that. Okay, um, that's okay. Anybody? Well, I'll tell you what they are just to make it easy. You get the sniper shot version where it targets individual follicles, food. It's aiming at them and destroying them and turns them into scar where those are. Usually perifollicular fibrosis, it gradually squeezes out the hair follicle and nothing is left there at the end of the day. And if you look at it clinically, you'll see just <clears throat> loss of the patulous ostea there and it just becomes a white scarred area. That's when it's just targeting the follicles. And then you get the um, army approach where it's like the invasion into Ukraine where the tanks are going across the border and they're just, the hair follicles rupture and you get suppuration and it wipes out everything in its path. Like in, you know, uh, folliculitis decalvans with neutrophils. The first pattern we see in things like lupus and lichen planum pilaris. The second pattern we see in things like separative folliculitis at rupture and tinea capitis at ruptures and, and folliculitis decalvans, those kind of conditions. Do we see either of those here? No. No, we don't. So this isn't going to be a scarring alopecia like that. It's pretty much, Mm -hmm. we ask ourselves also, you know, is it inflammatory or non-inflammatory? You see really much inflammation here? 
I didn't really see too much. No, no. You, so this is in the family of non-inflammatory, non-scarring alopecias, which is good. It means it's potentially reversible. Okay. And now, and we know that it's an alopecia because they should have eight to 10 follicles in, and we have only a couple. So we're going to higher magnification. <clears throat> now, what do we see? So some things are pathognomonic in dramatopathology, like molluscan bodies, herpes mm -hmm. virus, you know, infection in, in those multinucleated giant cells. Do we see anything here that's pathognomonic? Yes, I think like the pigmented hair casts. The Good. What is that called? What is that known as? Um, I know it's like blobs of melanin. Um, I know it's it goes melanin. tracks. And it's also a degenerate, degenerated hair shaft. And we call that trichomalacia. Okay. Trichomalacia. And where, where do you get that? What disease is, is this associated with? Um, often like traction, alopecia. Close. You're close, but close not is. quite a cigar. You're very close, but okay. not the full cigar, sadly enough. Um, just like follicular trauma in general, like trichotillosis. And... Well, what kind of follicular trauma? There's two kinds of follicular. There's, there's multiple types, but the two main types are traction, which is where like the little... African-American girls, her mom puts her hair in the cornrows and they gradually strangle the hair follicles and you get this onion skin fibrosis that gradually chokes off the follicle like hanging someone with piano wire. That's slow death of the follicle. And there you don't get this. You don't get trichomalacia in that situation. So in traction alopecia, true traction, no trichomalacia. It's like squeezing somebody's you know another analogy is a thumb screw you know just gradually destroying that hair fall what about if you're like a nervous nelly and you're worried about stuff you've got an exam coming up and you start twisting and pulling your hair and you know you're eating your hair and all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. you know, what's that disease known as i think it's like now known as trichotillosis or previously trichotillomania yeah well i, I still call it trichotillomania but i mean that's the disease itself i guess is it is it now we're calling it trichotillosis because we're not allowed to call it that or something i don't know but oh. it's basically due to more twisting and pulling and, and and tugging you know that sort of thing of the hair shafts and this occurs in any lots of different areas of the body Eyel eyelashes eyebrows um it's not just the scalp and it gives you this, you know, moth-eaten geometric patterns and that sort of thing that you see. So when you see this, it's pathognomonic of twisting and that type of trauma, not traction. Okay, that's an important distinction. And traction is, is permanent alopecia. You know, once you choke off those follicles and you turn it into a scar, it ain't coming back. It's not coming back. That's why we discourage you know, people from doing those kind of things. Because if they do it for a long enough period of time, those, you've destroyed the germinative, you know, cells at the mantle zone area and they never come back. So you don't want to do that. That's a permanent scarring alopecia that just hits the follicle. This, the good news is, is not scarring. If you get the patient's, you know, psychiatric or whatever other problems under control, this can go away and the hairs can actually come back and everybody lives happily ever after. So it's important distinction to remember. The only other setting we really see this in is patients that have alopecia areata. This patient does not have alopecia areata. They just have pure trichotillomania. But alopecia areata, sometimes they get the inflammation and then they say, oh my God, my hair is falling out. And guess what they do? They help it along. They start feeling it, saying, is the hair falling out today? And then the next thing you know, they've got superimposed trichotillomania. So uh, that's my... I'm I'm pretty sure that's true. I mean, I've always proven that. But anyway, so the great case here, great way to work through alopecia. So when you get an alopecia biopsy, that's how I want you to go through it. I want to spend more time here and less time in eye magnification. You can make this diagnosis here or certainly suspect it. And if you have good eyes, you can say, hey, wow, look at that. That's that's a trichomalacia. So you know they got to be twisting and, and pulling their, their hair shafts. Okay, this one is, is sort of a quasi-esoteric one, but it's one that you probably just at least should know about. 
Good morning, Dr. Cockrell. I'm going to be doing this one. Okay. The shave of a pedunculated lesion. The hyperkeratosis is making me think we're likely on an acral surface. Good. You're right. The next question, inflammatory versus neoplastic. Um, I was leaning neoplastic. Um, yeah. I had a hard time kind of like looking at the cells. They were like, a I um, think that uh, it was a bit blurry, but um, kind of that like background of a little bit like blue stroma and then no obvious like inflammatory cells. Okay, what's the bluish gray stroma all about? Um, so um, blue gray could be, you know, like mixoid. Good, uh, excellent. Yeah, this is kind of fuzzy, I agree. I guess when they scanned the slide and it didn't scan too terribly well. Um, but yeah, you've got that bluish gray stroma which and that blue gray material is mucin which is this type of mucin would be what um i'm not sure what you're going for like well there's two types of mucin there's the epithelial mucin and then there's connective tissue mucin the, okay so, so which type of mucin are we dealing with here i think this is connective tissue mucin Good. excellent so this is connective tissue mucin which is hyaluronic acid mm -hmm. which is going to be produced by these Blurry. <laughs> so, yes. I, I apologize for that. <laughs> okay. I can't think either. I, my vision is not as good as yours, but it's still fuzzy. But yeah, so let's say those are going to be some fibroblasts in the background, mm -hmm. and you got some dilated blood vessels. Um, you know, there's two. This this may have been pedunculated, but it may also have been sessile. Mm. So it may have been sort of just you know kind of elevated, but not actually on a stalk. That's another way of of getting kind of an elevated lesion. So. You think it's benign or malignant? I was thinking benign. Yeah, you're right. It's totally benign. And what general type of differentiation is exhibiting? Is it an e it's epithelial or non-epithelial? Uh, non-epithelial. Non-epithelial. It's got fibroblasts, histiocytes, mucin. So, it's so what overall does, diagnosis are we looking at here when we get something like this? So I kept going back and forth between two possible diagnoses. Um, just the, the general look of it made me think more superficial um, uh, acral fibromyxoma versus um, acquired digital fibro fibromyxoma. Sorry. <laughs> yes, there we go. Acquired digital fibrokeratoma, right? That's yes, the other thank thing. you. Okay. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so those two are on the, on the choice, so multiple choice. You've got two you've just excluded that don't make any sense <laughs> at all. And those last two there. So which one are you going to choose? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I I want to choose the acquired digital fibrokeratoma, but you said that this was a more nuanced <laughs> um, diagnosis. So um, I'll choose the but latter. But your observations are perfect. It would be a shame if when you came down to that last moment that you chose the wrong one because Couldn't you be? <laughs> weren't totally sure. What's one thing that you've described here that you generally do not see in acquired digital fibrokeratoma? So it, it's, it's concerning that mucinous. Um, yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. You do not see that mm -hmm. in acquired digital fibrokeratoma. I mean, I, I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. Actually, when you see those, it's, it's really a very thick collagen. You don't really get mucin. And, and the, this lesion is, is kind of fairly recently described um, I remember years ago, uh, there was a general pathologist that I think he saw this for the first time he'd ever seen. He called it desimplastic melanoma. Oh, gosh. It wasn't that. But the thing that tripped him up was that fibromucinous stroma, which you can see that in a desimplastic melanoma also. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not that. This is this is this entity. And it was, I think, kind of really became popularized in the in the 80s. And the mucin, it, it looks, the overall architecture looks similar to acquired digital fiber keratoma, but the mucin is, mm -hmm. the fact that you've got that mucinous stroma really would trip it into the superficial acral fiber keratoma. And that's, that's a pretty good name for it when you think about it. It's superficial, mm -hmm. it's in an acral location, uh, and it's got some fibrous tissue, but it's got the mixoid tissue. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's a really nice, sometimes they, name things intelligently and you can actually <laughs> use everything in there to sort of make the diagnosis. So uh, a fibrokeratoma has got, you know, again, mostly just the thick collagen bundle. So it really wouldn't have this. It does have a thick cortified layer, but it doesn't have the mucinous component to it. Okay. We got through seven out of eight. 
Um, any questions about anything we did today or comments? Hopefully that was educational for you guys. You can always go back and watch it again. Thank you so much, Dr. Cockwell. Well, thanks to you guys. Have a great holiday and uh, we will see you guys in the new year. Thank you.